Bin Laden had reason to resent having to leave Sudan. Not only had his assets in the country had been seized, but the Saudi monarchy had forced his family to cut him off, leaving him struggling financially. Still, he was returning to Afghanistan, a country that had played a significant role in his development, transforming him from a directionless Saudi millionaire into a respected Mujahideen leader. The theme that bin Laden liked to promote to his followers was that their travels were like the Haraja, a reference to the year 622, when the Prophet was forced to leave Mecca and go to Medina. When at first had seemed to be a defeat for the Prophet, had turned into a great advantage, as from the safety of Medina, he gained followers and developed a religion, then spread it across the globe. Bin Laden often invoked comparisons between himself and the Prophet, whose work he wished to further. He was in the habit of quoting the Prophet, and he tried modeling his life on his fasting, worshipping, even dressing accordingly, and making sure people noticed. In Bin Laden's mind, from deducing al-Qaeda and its leadership, the appropriate prosternation, when combined with rigorous painstaking attention to public image, served to rally his spirits and those of his followers. His belief in himself grew, and the reference with which his followers viewed him deepened. Through this combination of inner drive and public adulation, he could continue the work and the prophet had begun. Al-Qaeda wasn't starting from scratch in Afghanistan. In Sudan, bin Laden had built al-Qaeda into a global network, and this including setting up training camps and guest houses across Pakistan and Afghanistan. His operatives had also formed relationships with Pakistani intelligence officials, and they had paved the way for bin Laden to be welcomed by the Taliban. Bin Laden was curious to meet Mullah Omar, his new host and the leader of the Taliban. He didn't know what Omar looked like. He was something of a recluse. And as the Taliban had banned photography, no photographs had ever been taken of him, or at least none that were publicly available. He did know that Omar was blind in one eye. He had lost his sight while fighting with the Mujahideen against the Soviets and their supporters. Bin Laden was also eager to obtain a greater understanding of the Taliban itself. They had sprung seemingly out of nowhere in 1994 and had quickly imposed on parts of the country under their control an interpretation of Islam based more on Pashtun tribal rituals than on the religion itself. All forms of entertainment were banned. Television, sports, even famously kite flying. Girls' schools were closed down and women were not allowed out of their homes. Men without beards were arrested. The stricture amounts to a form of religious extremism unprecedented in Afghanistan, where religious tolerance had prevailed historically. The majority of the Muslim population in Afghanistan belonged to the Sunni Hanafi sect, which is considered the most liberal of the four schools of Islam in Sunni branch. Most of the rest are Shiites. Named after its founder, Imam Abu Hanafiya, Hanafi jurisprudence is known for its use of reason in legal opinions and for its decentralized decision-making. These two traits help make Hanafis into the most tolerant of Sunnis and explain the historical coexistence and mutual prosperity of Sunnis and other Muslims, as well as Hindus, Sikhs, and Jews. The shift in Afghanistan came with the Soviet Jihad between 1979 and 1989, when Saudi money came pouring into the country, and with these funds, Saudi clerics who espoused the more unyielding Wahhabi version of Sunni Islam. Wahhabism, the dominant form of Sunni Islam in Saudi Arabia, is seen either as indistinguishable from Salafi Islam, the name means forefather, and practice is ideally based on unadulterated centuries-old principles, or as a more strictly fundamentalist branch of Salafia. As more and more Wahhabi clerics gained influence, 
Wahhabism began to spread among Pashtuns, particularly vulnerable and susceptible to its precepts were the illiterate and the poor, many of whom simply followed what the clerics were told to them. When Wahhabism mixed with the takfir ideology popularized by Sayyid Qutb, intolerance and extremism resulted, and the Jihad Salafi movement was born. The appeal of an alliance between the Taliban and al-Qaeda was also based on a shared connection to, or perhaps more accurately, a manipulation of traditional Wahhabism. Taliban had imposed their Pashtun tribal code, Pashtun Wali, on the areas they controlled, and then labeled those laws Sharia law. In reality, their pre-Islamic tribal laws, while having been infused, with elements of Islam over the ages, did not accurately represent Islamic Sharia. The Taliban also lacked the Islamic scholars and jurisprudence to support what they were doing. Wahhabism, with its reverence for old traditions and ancient moral conduct, was the closest form of Islam to the Taliban's religious interpretations, and so they relied on Wahhabi scholars for religious justification. Al-Qaeda claims to be a Wahhabi group, and it mixes traditional Wahhabism with Salafi and Takfiri ideas, popular among jihadists, to create its own brand of terror. With both Al-Qaeda and the Taliban claiming similar interpretations of Islam, an alliance between them in many ways was a natural theological marriage. Of course, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban practice versions of radical Islam that are very different from each other. Al-Qaeda, for example, doesn't subjugate women to the same extent as the Taliban. And both Al-Qaeda and the Taliban's form of Islam are very different from traditional Wahhabism as practiced in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. After the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan in 1989, it took the victorious Mujahideen another three years to topple the Soviet-backed director, President Mohammad Najibullah. Various Mujahideen commanders now in charge subsequently took control of different parts of the country, and most ordinary fighters returned home. Others went to madrasas to study Islam. The fighters who returned home eventually saw that the Mujahideen commanders were as corrupt as the regime that they had replaced, and that true Islam, as they understood it from the standpoint of their Saudi-funded madrasas, was not being practiced or enforced. Groups of fighters led by Mullah Omar, the leader of the one small madrasa, began to come together with the idea of taking control of the country. They called themselves the Taliban, from the word Talib, meaning student, particularly a student of Islam. Supported by Pakistani and endorsed by the governments of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, Taliban groups began growing in size and imposed their ultra-strict version of Islam. It was not a coincidence that the leaders of the Taliban came from the most uneducated and backward of the Pashtun tribes. In Mullah Omar's town, for example, girls had never had any access to schools in the first place. As the Taliban gained control of more and more parts of the country, it began hosting radical Islamist groups from across the world, inviting them to use Afghanistan as a base. One such group was Al-Qaeda. Worldwide reaction to the gradual takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban was decidedly mixed. The United States initially supported the Taliban, which was seen as a barrier to the Shiite Iranian expansionism in Afghanistan, and U.S. officials also welcomed the Taliban's opposition to the drug trade. The fact that the Taliban was religiously intolerant in famously destroying together with al-Qaeda two 6th century Buddhas carved into a cliff in central Afghanistan and were oppressive to women, was not enough to change U.S. policy. When the Taliban captured Kandahar in April of 96, Mullah Omar removed the rarely seen entry 18th century cloak of the Prophet Muhammad from the mosque in which it resides, showing it to the assembled crowd as part of an effort to demonstrate that he had been ordained by God to lead Afghanistan. His followers named him Amir al-Munamin, commander of the faithful, the emir of the country. The Taliban took Kabul on September 26, 1996, and their first action was to capture 
Mohammed Najibullah, who had been driven from power and was living in a United Nations compound. They castrated the former president, dragged his body around the city, tied to a jeep, shot him, and hanged him and his brother from a pole. The action brought forth a stream of recruits from madrasas, including those in Pakistan. The largest grouping of opponents of the Taliban was the Northern Alliance, led by the charismatic Mujahideen general Ahmed Shah Massoud. Called the Lion of Panjir, after the valley in which he was born, Panjir meaning Valley of Five Lions, Massoud, a Tajik and a devout Muslim, was one of the most successful commanders fighting the Russians, with numerous victories to his credit. He had also fought the communists in Afghanistan. The Soviets had come to see him as an unbeatable master of guerrilla warfare. However, Massoud's weakness was that he was a poor diplomat. And the fact that he was a Tajik in a tribal society with a Pashtun majority prevented his rise to power before the Taliban came to dominate the country. And prevented would be allies from joining the Northern Alliance. Nonetheless, many in the West eventually came to see him as the best hope in stopping the Taliban. Mohammed bin Atash stood up and raised his hands in the air to silence the young men who had been chatting amongst themselves. Quote, Brothers, listen to me. I have something important to say, end quote. The crowd felt silent and turned to face him. It was mid-1996, and they were gathered at an Al-Qaeda-funded guesthouse on October Street in Sana, Yemen, where young men in the neighborhood sympathetic to the radical jihad movement frequently gathered. Muhammad first reminded his audience of the heroics of the previous generation of Mujahideen who had expelled the Russians from Afghanistan, and then, having sufficiently riled them up, told them that their opportunity had now come. He had, he continued, an important message from Osama bin Laden for them. By this point, the young men were listening intently. Muhammad was a persuasive speaker, and bin Laden was well known and admired for his role in the first Soviet jihad. Most of the young fighters were not newcomers to jihad, having served in Afghanistan, Chechnya, and Bosnia. Once again, the enemy was the Russians. Mohammed said, This time, Russia had sent fighters into Tajikistan to take control of that country, and from there expand further into Muslim lands. The young men asked Mohammed how they could help Sheikh Osama counter the Russians. Mohammed replied that he was traveling the next day to Afghanistan to see bin Laden and would send back instructions. Muhammad returned to Afghanistan, accompanied by another al-Qaeda member, Saad al-Madini, later a bin Laden bodyguard. The two men went to see the al-Qaeda leader at the Jalalabad training camp. Muhammad had known bin Laden for most of his life. Their fathers had been friends growing up in Yemen, and Muhammad's father had sent Muhammad to fight with bin Laden. He had soon become one of his most trusted aides. Muhammad reported to bin Laden that he had recruits and that the al-Qaeda leader had asked him to find. When bin Laden returned to Afghanistan from Sudan, his terrorist organization was in bad shape. Not only had the forced move from Sudan damaged morale, but funds were severely depleted. And, even more importantly, new recruits were not lining up. The death of Abu Ubaid al-Banshiri on Lake Victoria, too, had left a hole. There was no shortage of young Muslims willing to engage in jihad. Many had been inspired by the Afghan jihad against the Soviets and by the theological arguments put forth by leaders like Abdullah Yusuf Azam to fight oppressors in Bosnia and Chechnya. They traveled to those places through the same infrastructure that supported the Afghan jihad, the recruitment channels, funding, non-government organizations, and tribal facilitators were all in still one place. The problem was that al-Qaeda's jihad was non-traditional, and most Muslim fighters didn't relate to it. Their definition of the obligation of jihad centered on physically fighting wrongs and expelling aggressors who were actually occupying Muslim lands or oppressing Muslims. According to this thinking, the first Afghan war was justified because the Soviet Union had invaded Muslim lands. 
They fought in Bosnia and Chechnya because they were told that Muslim women and children were being raped and slaughtered. The idea of a secret war of terrorism was unfamiliar to them. Egyptians, through Dr. Ayman al-Zwahiri and others, were the only ones they truly familiar with, with this type of war and its theological justifications. The broad goal of fighting America didn't make sense to these young fighters. What Muslim lands was America occupied? What crimes was America perpetrating against Muslims? These were the questions young men asked al-Qaeda recruiters. Their past experience with America had been positive. The United States had been on the side of the Muslims in Afghanistan, Bosnia, and Chechnya. Bin Laden realized that to rope these young men in, he needed to create a traditional enemy for them to fight. The Tajik militants fighting the Russians at the time announced that they would welcome new fighters, providing conventional battles and an enemy that would surely bring some of the former Mujahideen and veterans of Bosnia and Chechnya back to Afghanistan. The land of jihad, as bin Laden loved to call it. After discussing details with bin Laden, Muhammad sent the facts to the guest house in Sana, Yemen, about two weeks following his and Saad al Madini's return to Afghanistan, instructing the emir in Sana to inform those who had been present when he had spoken about the Tajik front was open for jihad. He provided directions for those wishing to join him at the front. Among the young men who would heed the call to arms was Abu Jandal. Later, in 1996, 40 fighters showed up in Talukwin, Afghanistan, which served as the base camp for the Tajik Jihad. Most of the 40 were from the Arabian Peninsula, Yemen, and Saudi Arabia. Two were from Pakistan. The Tajik contingent called themselves Karabat al-Shamal, literally the Northern Battalion but known as the Northern Group, not to be confused with the Northern Alliance, because of the location of their operations in the north of Afghanistan, near the Tajik border. Muhammad introduced the new fighters to the leader of the group, Hamza al-Ghamdi, standing unnoticed in the midst. When he came forward, a hush fell over the group. Hamza was a legend in Afghanistan from the First Soviet War. He had fought many storied battles against the Soviets. In the 1987 Battle of Jaj in Jalalabad, he and bin Laden and 50 Mujahideen were said to held off 200 Soviet Spetsnaz soldiers. Hamza was muscular and strong and loved to wrestle. He trained the new recruits hard, and they gave deep respect for his skill and commitment. Once he deemed them ready, the group moved to Babadikistan, which served as a staging area between the entry into Tajikistan. They settled outside the city of Fayezbad. Hamza knew its Afghan military commander, Karid Mand, from the first Afghanistan jihad. And Mand agreed to give the northern group his protection. A week later, they marched toward Tajikistan. It was snowing when they arrived at the border, making it impossible for them to travel any further. So they set up camp there for the night. The next morning, they were visited by Abdullah Nuri, the leader of the Tajik Mujahideen and of Hizb Wadab Islami, a Tajik Islamic party. Abdullah Nuri addressed the fighters. Thank you for coming. We are honored that you are helping us. We need you to remain here for now while my Tajiks scout the area for Russians. My men are more familiar with the terrain and are less likely to be spotted and captured. Hamza agreed to the plan. Eight hours later, Nori returned to announce that his scouts had found Russians stationed at the border and that entering Tajikistan would be prohibitively dangerous. They would have to wait until the Russians moved on. Asked how long that would take, Nori replied, days or even weeks, we don't know. The northern group settled in uncertainly. One evening, Hamza summoned Salim Hamdan, a promising recruit. We can't stay here much longer, he told the young man. Our group members are having problems with the local Afghanis. They keep demanding more money, weapons, and supplies from us. We keep giving them things, and they keep asking for more. 
We worry that if we don't give them what they want, they'll try to hand us over to the Russians. Hamza was considered trustworthy and honest. Hamza told him, I need you to travel to Fayyazabad and tell Karad Wand what is going on. The Afghan military commander, who had given the new Mujahideen his protection, had not accompanied them. Hamdan did as he was told, returning two days later. He said, Man says we should leave this area, and if we go to Fayezbad, he'll give us his protection. Hamza agreed that they had to leave. They traveled back to Talaquin, and then went to Kunduns, a city in northern Afghanistan where they stayed at a Tajik refugee camp, one of the several set up for those fleeing the civil war. Their aim was to get to Jalalabad or Kabul. The main routes, however, were cut off, as the Taliban and the Northern Alliance were engaged in heavy fighting. 